Peace, family. Chauncey, a.k.a. U. Karima, GMOG Media. Right back at you again with another GMOG Media Spotlight. All right, family. Got another heavy topic I want to talk about. Um, this particular topic I want to talk about is dealing with the black family structure and why the black family structure is on life support. And I'm going to talk about the, the history of why the black family structure is on life support. Um, and I'm going to go into some parallels and why it is going to continue to be on life support um, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so like I said before, last the last time I posted my vlog, you know, we live under a system of white supremacy. For those who don't know or understand what white supremacy is or how it works, everything else would only confuse you. Okay, so if you don't know, under, if you don't know or understand what white supremacy is, like I said, I just suggest you to go back, do some research, get some literature, get some literature by Nilly Fuller Jr. and Dr. Francis Cress Wilson. All right, just to get you, you know, up to speed on some things. All right, so uh, I wanted to talk about this topic, number one, the black family structure um, and why it is on life support and will continue to be on life support because we live under a system of white supremacy and um, the only group of people or the only system in place that can either take it off of life support or revive it back into, uh, you know, um, picture health is us. So we have to replace the system of racism, which is white supremacy, with the system of justice. And also people talk about justice, you know, and they don't understand the actual definition of justice. Well, the compensatory definition of justice is this. The compensatory definition of justice is number one, guaranteeing that no person is mistreated. And number two, guaranteeing that the person who needs the help the most gets the most constructive help. All right, it's very, it's, it's very cut and dry. That is the compensatory definition of justice. Once again, that the compensatory definition of justice is ensuring no person is mistreated, okay? And number two, guaranteeing that the person who needs help the most gets the most constructive help. All right, family. So um, I want to break this down with the uh, the black family structure. Now, me personally, you know, I've been married for 11 years, have three beautiful uh, children, three beautiful boys. Uh, you know, marriages are not perfect at all. But, uh, you know, I've been married for 11 years, I'm happily married. Um, and a black family consists of a mother and a father, right? That's a household, the mother and the father. Now, because we live under a system of white supremacy, proverbially, we, I say that I am the head of the household, right? Right? Because of a man and financially, I am the head of the household, proverbially. But because we live under a system of white supremacy, Technically, I'm not the head of anything. The people who are in charge of the wealth and the resources and the military of the world are the white supremacists. So they dictate what you do on a day to day basis. OK, everything is controlled by them. Those are actual facts. Everything is controlled by them. And you can say, hey, you know, I, I work for myself, so I don't have to I don't have to follow orders from the white man. Well, technically you do because your customers, your clients, they work for, quote unquote, the Europeans, the white, the white man. Everybody does. It's just those are actual facts. So you can't really escape that. All right. So, like I said, I'm going to go back to the topic. Um, why the black family structure is on life support. So what I want to do is I want to take it back to 1965. I want to take it back to 1965. Crucial, crucial year. I want to take it back to the 60s, particularly 1965. The reason why that particular year is important is, is a couple. There's a couple of things. 
Now, if you go back on my blog, on my uh, older blogs on GMOG Media TV, I talked about the Kerner Commissioner Report. Okay, go back and watch that vlog where I break that, that blog down. That basically I'm talking about 1965 also, which particular, which in that year, President Lyndon B. Johnson um, was a president of the United States at that time. And uh, he wanted a report to find out why there is so much violence and riots breaking out in these urban communities that were heavily populated by blacks. And the, and the Kerner Commissioner Report was, was born at that time. Like I said, go back to my video where I break all that stuff down. Okay, so 1965 also had um, very important, crucial statistic in pertaining to black families. And there was a report that was also uh, commissioned by, or led by President Lyndon B. Johnson to do for black families at that time all right there was a report that was actually created by a white man a white european okay who was a liberal by the name of daniel patrick monahan okay he did a report um that was called the negro family the case for national action okay so this dealt with the black family structure and how the black family structure was basically falling apart. So you had topics dealing with um, single parents, children being born out of wedlock, children being born into poverty, etc. Um, and they did statistical data at that time, and it was all pointing to at that time, and it's still this study, obviously, but it was pointing to white supremacy, racism. Okay. That is the root foundation of everything, okay? So that report, like I said, was dealing with statistical data um, on single parent households led by African-Americans, particularly females, okay? Um, the reason why this topic is so important is because if you look at today's society right now in 2015, um, there's a lot of things going on in the media um, pertaining to black families and even in the entertainment industry also. And like I said, you know, racism, white supremacy, they control all nine areas of activity, okay? Uh, which includes, you know, media, entertainment, labor law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when you're dealing with that and the way that black families are portrayed in the media right now it, it really is no such thing as really a black family you have a lot of um, people whether it's on entertainment or in the news the mainstream media news families are broken so you have single parent households particularly mothers raising children okay when you have that situation that basically creates other elements that will have more setbacks for that child to grow as they become older and get into adulthood. So they have more obstacles to overcome um, growing up in a single parent household, uh, particularly raised by a mother. So with this report by uh, Daniel Patrick Monahan in 1965, like I said, he talks about how the uprising of single parent homes um, on the rise uh, because of economically deprived areas okay um, and also you know out of child out of child wedlock births are on the rise okay now this report is 50 years old there was a revised report okay that was done back in 2013 all right this revised report was actually funded um, by the Urban Institute and also Open Society Foundation. Now, shout out to Open Society Foundation. Um, and I'm only going to read this report just to prove a point. But you know, sidebar, uh, you know, Open Society Foundation is uh, funded by George Soros. Okay, George Soros. 
um, is basically the, the progenitor, the funder of Black Lives Matter. All right. So speaking of Black Lives Matter, you know, um, going back to what I was talking about, the, the topic at hand, you know, the black family structure. All right. So Black Lives Matter. Yes, I agree with the premise of that. Right. I agree with the premise of that. Black lives do matter. Because we live in a system of white supremacy and we are being mistreated based off color, killed based off color on a day to day basis by the system that we're living in. Okay. But the start of it all comes from the home, the foundation. So black love matters as all as well. Black love matters as well. And um Shout out to Sister Courtney Omega for starting the Black Loves Matter movement in South Florida. Uh, that's something people need to get involved in as well. So it all starts at home, which is why I'm talking about this topic at hand right now. All right. So going back to the report that was revised for the Moynihan Report Revisited in 2013, that was actually sponsored by Urban Institute and Open Society Foundation. OK, so they basically did a follow up report for that uh, report done back in 1965, okay? And not surprising, the statistics are even worse, okay? So I'm just gonna read a couple of things from this article. So basically, they did some um, statistical reports from the 1960s to 2013, okay? So they found out that more children across racial groups are born outside of marriage now than in the 1960s and there's a graph that shows that from the 60s okay from the 60s was up by 16 percent from 2013 and now 73 percent more children across racial groups are born outside of marriage 73 percent okay there's another graph that shows more children live without their fathers now than in the 1960s. That's up by 50%. Okay. Another graph that shows share of women who are married has been declining since the 1960s. All right. So that basically means that less women are getting married. They're just not getting married. They're just rather just uh, basically have a child out of wedlock raise a child by themselves, collect child support, if that's the case, and that's it. Um, another statistical data is uh, child poverty rate declined markedly in the 1960s, but have varied in narrow band since. All right, so they're breaking down the poverty rates, okay. Um, there's another figure that says black white employment gap has increased for men disappeared for women all right and, and you know this this particular revised follow-up article is uh well detailed uh very well detailed and uh it basically breaks down um what happened in 1965 and what's happening today and all this all the statistical data is just skyrocketing at all time highs. Okay. So when you have a situation where the black family structure is basically the woman, the head of the household, raising children by themselves, like I said, you have more obstacles that your children would face because of the element that they're in. So when you have a black family, a total black family, a male and a female that are married raising children, you have less obstacles, obstacles rather, to overcome. Number one, when you have a black, a, a black family, economically, you have more income, right? Right, when you have a male, head of the household, a female, both working or the male is the breadwinner 
female as a stay-at-home mom or even homeschooling their children that's more of a black that's more of a structure right so they're getting the best education that they need the father has a good job they're stable they have a single family home etc etc right so they have less obstacles to overcome in their environment as opposed to a single family mother who's raising a child in a lower income area higher crime school system is probably well we i live in the state of florida so when you live in a low poverty area that particular school is most likely an f school so you have schools that are graded by the school board of education in the state of florida and they're graded from a to f so when you live in a lower income area you have lower graded schools which you would get worse education right when you have worse education that leads to less opportunities okay and when you have less opportunity that leads to crime okay but when, it, when something leads to crime that leads to prison okay so that basically is a pipe to prison system that is concocted and developed by racism and white supremacists so that also includes gentrification as well so you can have pockets of and i don't like to say black communities but you have pockets of black people or i should say people of african descent that are heavily populated in certain areas of urban cities okay they can get sprawled out any any time so if a developer a white owned developer a white businessman wants to redevelop this certain s section of town you know to bring in more tourists and to generate revenue for the city they can gentrify that area push out the lower income people out spread them across an another part of town okay those people may have section be on section eight etc etc they push them out another part of part of town that particular town they go to crime starts to rise because you have the section 8 uh, folks the lower income folks living in that area and that particular area starts to deteriorate if it's not if, it, if it's not kept up well but most likely it will be turned down because of the gentrification that's taking place all right so that's one element all right of why the black family structure is on life support. Now, the other element I want to talk about is um, the homosexual agenda. All right. Now, and this is important because I want to talk about the homosexual agenda and why the particular black family structure is on life support because of the homosexual agenda being pushed upon mainstream media. See, prior to 1973, and I'm gonna go back to 1973 and why that's, that year is important. Prior to the early 1970s, talking about homosexuality was a taboo, was a taboo subject. You didn't really hear about it. You didn't really read about it. Um, no one confessed to being homosexual. Um, on a mainstream level it was such a taboo subject so taboo that psychologists deemed homosexuality as a mental illness all right this was uh, concocted or listed in the diagnostic statistical manual for mental disorders okay by psychologists prior to the 1970s okay now going going forward to 1973 and that's a key year. So 1973 is when the gay rights activists decided to protest and pressure the, the DSM makers, the psychologists, to take out homosexuality as a mental illness. The gay rights activists say it's not a mental illness, okay? It should not be treated as a mental illness at all. It's a normal way of life, a normal way of thinking. Okay? So 1973, the DSM, or the DSM-2, was forced to remove homosexuality as a mental disorder. Okay? 
Okay, so that family was the start of the homosexual agenda. All right. Again, the black family structure consists of a male and a female, right? Now today, a family can consist of a single mother, a single father, a male and a male, right? Because of gay marriage, a female and a female because of gay marriage, a so-called transgender, okay? They can marry someone, so on and so forth. So you have so many different variations of a quote unquote family structure. Um, because of this, the homosexual agenda has been a such a powerful movement since the 70s that they changed the landscape of the family structure till this day. And it's continuing to change. OK, it's, it's continuing to change to change the face of what a family should look like. So again, the, the uh, a family, a black family is a male and a female. But as of today, going forward, a family can be anything, basically. A single mother, like I said, uh, two males, two females, etc., etc. All right? Um, now, another thing I wanna bring to the table also is not only the homosexual agenda right but also uh foods dealing with foods dealing with you know as as of today you know when you're eating foods and things of that nature a lot of things are processed a lot of things aren't grown organically so you have a higher chance of eating something that's been genetically modified. So the point is, check the labels of what you eat. Check the labels, all right? Um, even myself, you know, I always check the labels. I try to be conscious of what I try to eat and, and stay away from GMO-based foods. And, uh, you know, companies are, are really starting to do that as well. Uh, but the point, the point is I want to make is this. Foods today, especially genetically modified foods, and the, the pesticides and the different foreign um, substances they feed these animals. Now, these are facts I'm about to bring to the table. I don't deal with conspiracies, okay? These particular pesticides and foreign objects or foreign substances that they give these animals, okay? It's a fact that there are elements and there are things that can change the hormones of an animal okay it can affect the hormone level it can affect the blood levels it can affect the um, sexual abnormalities of an animal so just to back up that claim i'm going to play a clip of a black scientist um, out in california and this story happened earlier this year. And once again, we live in a system of white supremacy. So you may or may not have heard this story because it, it really did not get a lot of legs in mainstream media. It was pretty much swept under the, under the rug, but it should have caught more attention. OK, so this black scientist who uh, basically uh, discovered a herbicide that causes sexual abnormalities in animals. OK, and this black scientist you know, work for this white owned company um, that uh, this company tried to stop this scientist who was a melanated scientist. They tried to stop the scientist from publishing the discover the discoverings that this this black scientist found. Okay? Because everything that he found was just basically um, so so confidential that they did not want this being leaked out, you know, and his life was threatened. Um, and uh, I'm gonna play this clip uh, so you get a better understanding of, of what I'm pointing at. And uh, you'll find this very interesting. Here it is. Well, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We've been with you for 18 years as we turn to another story. Yes, now we turn to the story of a University of California scientist who discovered that a popular herbicide may have 
harmful effects on the endocrine system. Tyrone Hayes was first hired in 1997 by a company that later became agribusiness giant Syngenta. They asked him to study their, prod their product, atrazine, a pesticide that is applied to more than half the corn crops in the United States and widely used on golf courses and Christmas tree farms. But after Hayes found results that the, the manufacturer did not expect, that atrazine causes sexual abnormalities in frogs and could cause the same problems for humans, Syngenta refused to allow him to publish his work. This was the start of an epic feud between the scientist and the corporation. Now a new article in The New Yorker magazine uses court documents from a class action lawsuit against Syngenta to show how it sought to prevent the Environmental Protection Agency from banning the profitable chemical, which is already banned by the European Union. To start with, the company's public relations team drafted a list of four goals. Reporter Rachel Aviv writes, quote, the first was, quote, discredit Hayes. In a spiral-bound notebook, Syngenta's communications manager, Sherry Ford, who referred to Hayes by his initials, wrote that the company could prevent citing of TH data by revealing him as non-credible. He was a frequent topic of conversation at company meetings. Syngenta looked for ways to exploit Hayes, faults, problems. If TH involved in scandal, Enviros will drop him, Ford wrote. Well, for more, we're joined by TH himself. That's right. Tyrone Hayes is with us, professor of integrative biology at the University of California, Berkeley, joining us from the campus TV station right now in Berkeley. Welcome to Democracy Now! Um, can you tell us what happened to you, how you were originally tied to Syngenta, the research you did, and what prevented you from originally publishing it? Well, <clears throat> here at Berkeley, I was a, a new assistant professor. I was already studying the effects of hormones and the effects of chemicals that interfere with hormones on amphibian development. And I was approached by the manufacturer and asked to study the effects of atrazine, uh, the herbicide, on frogs. And after I discovered that it interfered with male development and caused uh, males to turn into females to develop eggs, the company tried to prevent me from publishing and from discussing that work with other scientists outside of their panel. What was the process within the company as you raised the, your findings? Uh, what was their immediate reaction uh, to, uh, to what you had come across? Well, initially, they seemed uh, sort of supportive. Um, we, you know, we designed more studies, we designed more analysis, and they encouraged me to do more analysis. But as the further analysis uh, just supported the original finding, they became less interested in moving forward very quickly. And eventually, they moved to asking me to manipulate data or to rep misrepresent data. And ultimately, they told me I could not publish or could not talk about the data outside of their closed panel. And, uh, Professor Hayes, talk about exactly what you found. What were the abnormalities you found in frogs, the gender-bending nature of uh, this drug, mm -hmm. atrazine? Well, initially, we found that the larynx or the voice box in exposed males didn't grow properly. And this was an indication that the male hormone testosterone was not being produced uh, at appropriate levels. And eventually, we found that not only did were these males demasculized or chemically castrated, but they also were starting to develop ovaries or starting to develop eggs. And eventually, we discovered that these males didn't breed properly, uh, that some of the males actually completely turned into females. So we had genetic males that were laying eggs and reproducing as females. And now we're starting to show that some of these males actually show, um, I guess, what, what we call homosexual behavior. They actually prefer to mate with other males. Yeah, that, that's white supremacy at its finest right there. You have a black scientist, okay, who was commissioned to, you know, study the the actual herbicide and what he found was something that the white supremacists did not want him to find okay um and that was mind-boggling to discover that what they use can turn a male animal to a female and vice versa all right so why is this why is this important why is GMO based foods, okay, homosexuality important for the black family structure being on life support. It's simple. 
going back to what I said before. The family structure consists of a male and a female. Not a male and a male. Not a female and a, and a female. Not a trans, a so-called transgender. Okay? It's a male and a female. All right? So when you have those particular elements in place, you have less obstacles for your children to overcome when you have a totality of a family structure, okay? When you don't have a black family structure, you have more obstacles to come, which was shown in the report that I, that I showed you from the Moynihan report and the one that was revisited uh, by the Urban Institute and Open Society Foundation. You have more obstacles to overcome because of economics and systematic racism, which is white supremacy, all right? That is the reason why the black family structure is on life support. You have the homosexuality agenda being pushed upon you. So you have your children looking at TV, if they're watching TV or social media, but they'll find out one way or another. So the gay agenda is everywhere. You're gonna be asking questions. Why, why are these two men, you know, on TV raising this child? That's not a family, all right? That's just my opinion. That's not a family. Um, but that's considered, a, that's considered a, a family in, I guess, the mainstream media's uh, part protection or depiction, rather, of a family structure, right? And then on top of that, you know, when you live in, and it's, it, is, it is correct, and I'm gonna paint a picture also with this uh, illustration. When you live in a lower income area or an economically deprived area, what do you see outside of where you live as far as what you can eat? You have fast food restaurants, right? You have McDonald's. Wherever you live, you may have a chicken spot, whether it be KFC, Popeyes, uh, Bojangles, or something like that. Um, you have foods that are less healthier, more processed, more saturated, things of that nature. And on top of that, when you have these particular uh, fast food restaurants in lower income areas, you're not on the top of that. You're not going to see healthier food alternatives such as a Whole Foods Market, such as a Trader Joe's, such as a Gelson's in the lower income areas. Why? Because, first of all, they don't accept EBT cards. They don't accept Section 8 vouchers. Okay? It's just that simple. Also, if you notice, if you can go to anywhere in any quote-unquote urban community area. If you go to now South Florida, we have a local uh, grocery called Publix. Or uh, better yet, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Winn-Dixie. So we have a, gro a local grocery here called Winn-Dixie, right? So if you go to a, a Winn-Dixie, that is in a lower income area, okay? You go inside there, you're going to see certain foods, right? That are there, you're gonna see certain sections in the store that are there, that are not even located or that not even positioned in another part of town that is predominantly white, right? You're not going to see those kind of things there. The way the store is laid out, the way the store is, even the customer service. If you go to a predominantly white area in that same Winn-Dixie store, the total experience is, is different. It's completely different. And, and that's for a fact. I've seen it firsthand. Those are facts. All right. So when, the, when, the, when you have those kind of conditions, um, those are the obstacles I'm talking about in, in in terms of why the black family structure is on life support because of the obstacles of the foods that you eat that can cause different abnormalities um sexual abnormalities um any kind of health abnormalities they can cause major problems lifelong problems not to mention vac vaccines but that's a whole nother topic of conversation okay so i'm going to stay with the topic at hand the homosexuality agenda okay it's causing the black, it's causing the family structure, particularly the black family structure to be 
no longer male and female. It could be basically anything. You have GMO-based foods that can cause abnormalities. And on top of that, it goes back to systematic racism, which is white supremacy. They can pull the life support system. They can pull that plug anytime they want because they control everything. All right, and the only way, the only way to overcome the system of racism, which is white supremacy, is to replace it with a system of justice. And the compensatory definition of justice is very simple, once again. Justice is guaranteeing no person is mistreated and guaranteeing the person who needs help the most gets the most constructive help. It's just that simple. All right, family. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and share. All right. Definitely need more subscribers to my YouTube channel. A lot of people uh, still aren't aware about GMOG Media TV, but make sure you subscribe and uh, share this information. Um, I'm going to definitely try to, like I said, be more consistent with these vlogs and try to bring the information to the people and uh, show from my research the information that's going to help open up some eyes and, uh, you know, cause you guys to get inspired as far as making some changes of what you can do. All right, family. Once again, Chauncey, a.k.a. Ukarima, GMOG Media, signing out. Peace.